Thank you for being here this evening. I'm taking my mask off. You do you. You know, do what you feel comfortable doing. Um, just aware that some of us have uh, small ones that we have connections with and, and uh, elderly people and all kinds of stuff that makes us want to be careful. So that's good. Um, I put up on the board here um, a question that I'd, I'd like some feedback on here in just a minute. And uh, I think we, we know each other, at least we're comfortable enough with each other at this point to speak about this. I thought about bringing little notes and note paper and having you write notes and post them around the room and I would read them and I thought, well, people ought to just stand out or just say what they want to say. I think people can do that. But before I do anything else, before we start addressing this and responding, and I, I do want to hear how you, especially those who were here last week, have experienced your focus on praise and lament, which is what we talked about last week. But before we do that, I just want to say a word for last Sunday's practicum. There were not a lot of people there, but those of us who were there, an absolutely dynamic time. I mean, it, I just found it an absolutely dynamic time. Carrie, you were there, and Karen, you were there. A couple of people had not been to the class at all and showed up that Sunday, just decided to come, and it was just wonderful. And um, who else was there? Chelsea was there. Um, just a really nice day. We did a couple of different things with praises that are based on words, and we ta I talked a little bit about how our, our praises are so word-oriented, so word-based. But then we listened to some African music, which we did not understand the words of, of course, but we could understand the jubilance under it. And we talked about uh, sort of non-word-based or non-intelligible non, uh, non word-based prayer. And then we just shared, went around the room and shared experiences where when did you have an experience with God that prompted praise? And I just, I found that really interesting. I was very moved and very, just very pleased and very inspired by what was said. So anyway, if you don't, if you're not coming to the practica, I encourage you to try it. Uh, we're up on the, we're on the second floor, which is actually a floor down in the, what do we want to call it? The silver and glitz room. You know, <laughs> we're in there in the silver and glitz room. So just look around if you don't see us. So anybody have a response to this? What have you experienced in the past week? Like there was an invitation for you to meditate on Psalms and I'd given some Psalm numbers, um, an invitation for you to write your own lament. Talked about that. Um, thinking about your thanksgiving, your experiences of awe with God, you know, awe in response to God. Any comments? Like I guess what I'm trying to say is how's this working for you? How's this whole prayer thing working for you because here's my thinking about study and learning if it doesn't make any difference let's go out to dinner I'm serious I, I'm not inter I mean I've been a teacher for a long time and I've been a student longer than I've been a teacher I'm not interested in teaching or sitting in classes that don't make any difference like what's what are we doing building up brownie points the Lord doesn't care who's in class so to speak. He's not taking attendance as far as getting into heaven any faster or whatever. So any changes, if you, if you don't have something that addresses this specifically, what would you say is happening to your prayer life since you started this course or since you began to think about it? Or? Well, I've been inspired by some of the things that we've been talking about. So like last Thursday when I was driving to work, I was thinking about, I just spent the time like say, using words to praise God. Yippee. And then today, I listened to the Messiah all the way through twice. <laughs> yeah. Work. And started, I started like mouthing the words. I couldn't <laughs> sing it out loud, but I started mouthing the words with my, with my headphones on. And it was just just saying those words. I mean, even though I didn't say it out loud, it was just amazing. Yeah. The, you know, the praise and you know, just going through that whole Good. process of all the um, different pieces. Good. Very good. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this in encouragement, but also in, in compassion, so to speak. Don't worry if you don't see immediate cause and effect relationships between those experiences and whatever else is going on in life. You know what I'm saying? It's not like we put in praise and get out a, you know, all day sucker or something, you know. So we, we, we praise. We don't know where that's going. You know, that's out there at the edges of the, you know, universal pond somewhere making a little ripple. We do not know how God receives what we give, but we give it nonetheless. Anybody else? Just comments. Yeah, Susan. Ah. Um, and as you mentioned, when you write to lament, mm -hmm. um, and, and if there's looking for God in it, uh, praising Him for His goodness, 
Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Good. And I've also been more in the Word and studying the scriptures and trying to Good. not trying. Working at weaving those scriptures into the confession. Mm, good. Mm -hmm. uh, to start with confession and lament and praise. And Good. So it's been um, a wonderful, I can say that the book has absolutely changed how I do my time with Jesus in the morning. Good. I'm, I'm I'm, I say, I'm asking these questions not because I want you to say how great things are going, uh, how, how much the class is helping you, but I am interested in whether it's making an impact on you and at least a couple of people, you know. Yeah, Jenny? Okay, so I'm like always the negative person. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I've been trying to do the praise thing. It always turns into like Thanksgiving. That's okay. Like it just yeah. Changes, okay. No, <laughs> no, absolutely not, absolutely not. But that just depends on how our minds are going and where, what we're experiencing at the time. So I, I, I'm not, that doesn't seem like doing it wrong. That just seems like a different take on it. Because it's really hard to parse between thanksgiving and praise. Because if you're thanking God for something, you are implicitly saying, I'm thanking you, A, because I know you're the one up there giving me these things. You know, when people say, give thanks, and they're not religious, I want to say, to whom? You know, it's like waiters who come to the table and say, enjoy. I want to say, enjoy what? Give me a direct object. You know, who, to whom are we thanking? You know, so that you are implicitly saying, I'm thanking you, God, because you healed so-and-so or because you made so-and-so possible or because you protected this or that. You know what I'm saying? So it's in there. You just haven't, you just haven't given it words. That's okay. I think that's important. See, we can't, we can't start editing our prayers to such an extent that we think, well, I'm doing it wrong. Don't do that. I guess the thing is, like, I feel like it's not natural for me to just be like, oh, God, you're so wonderful. Like, I just don't talk like that to anybody. Like, I'm not like, oh, Eric, you're so wonderful. Really? <laughs> Poor Eric. Poor Eric. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Yes, I understand that. No gratuitous compliments from you. <laughs> no, I, I really do hear you, and I think what you're saying is important because our personalities, kind of our default setting, if you will, whether it's inborn or nurtured in, is going to affect the way we are. Matt said last week when he was sitting here, he didn't like to have to conjure up praise. I know, I know what you're saying. It's like, you know, sending sappy valentines and stuff. You know, I did that once. Like, I won't do that again. <laughs> 72 years later, not doing it again. So, you know, that, that's important, I think, to understand. I also think, though, and this is kind of something that I don't know if this makes sense to people or not, but I believe the Holy Spirit has a vision. I think God has a design, and Carrie maybe can resonate with this. The architect has a design, and the reality of the, the building, the structure, so to speak, the creation, doesn't quite fit the design, you know? I think God has a design for each and every one of us that we have yet to fulfill. We will fulfill it in the new heaven and the new earth. But in the meantime, you know, we really are, in the best sense of the phrase, a work in progress. I, I am not naturally, you might say, well, I'm not naturally X. Does God want you to be X? See, I, I don't know the answer to that. So putting ourselves in submission to Christ and saying, Lord, you know me, <laughs> you know who I am. I'm thanking you for X, Y, and Z, or I'm praising you for this, but I never get around to the thanks part. Whatever it is, you know, God, God is making us who he wants us to be. So, you know, do, give, give all the thanks you can, I'd say. I'd say go at it full heartedly. Anything else? Yes. Mm hmm It's important for me, yeah. Right. Yeah. Pay attention. 
I mean, that's, that didn't start, that's not just a Christian idea. That's a Thoreau, that's a mindfulness, that's a, a lot of different people talk about paying attention. But if we pay attention and then from the thing to which we are paying attention, the chickadee or the, the little dogwood blossoms on the trees outside my windows or whatever they are, if your thoughts then vault up to the one who created those, see, then, you're, then that's prayer, it seems to me, whether you utter a prayer or not. If you're thinking, oh, you know, there, that wouldn't be there if we just didn't have anything. You know, we're, so what is, what is it that we are paying attention to, whether it's something in nature or something in our own lives, and then how does that springboard our ideas up to God? That's, that's really key. So let's, let's uh, have some praise then, and let's have a prayer in order to get started. And don't let me forget, I want to take attendance this evening just because I'd like to know who's here. I never know from one, son, one week to the next. I just have a blank. So would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are full of thanks and praise, whether we all express them in the same ways or not. We are thankful for everything about life. The things that we can manage to pay attention to and the things that completely escape our notice. But we thank you tonight for the fact that we have a warm and dry place to meet, that we have freedom to meet, that we have safety to meet, that we have a reason to meet, that we have minds to understand some things that you're trying to teach us about prayer, and that we have a willingness given to us by the Holy Spirit because of our faith, a willingness to understand and to exalt you in our praises and to come to you in our laments. Lord God, we thank you so much for salvation through Christ. We thank you for sanctification by the work of your Spirit. We offer this praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, tonight, speeding on down the highway of prayer, highway of love, the highway of prayer, we're going to talk about sacred reading. Now, I'm using that term to mean lots of different things. You may have heard this as the Latin phrase Lexio Divina, you may have heard that phrase. You may have seen that in some writing and so forth. It also, we could also say it is, uh, some people would call it contemplation. In this case, of scripture. I'll abbreviate there, okay? We might also call it, some people would call it meditative prayer. I don't want to spend a lot of time on terminology. It really doesn't make any difference. But I will make this distinction just for the purposes of this class because of the way I'm using language, okay? I'm going to call what we're talking about tonight meditation, okay? Next week, we'll be talking about something called contemplation. Some people use those words entirely opposite of the way I'm using, and other people use them to mean different things. But tonight, we're going to be talking about meditation. The distinction I'm making, and again, this is a personal distinction. I don't think I'm out of line, but I'm just wanting to be clear. In my way of teaching and thinking, meditation has an object. So you're using a, an image, or in our case, we're using scripture, so we're using words, the storyline of, of a gospel account or the wording of a gospel account as a, as a prompt for meditation, okay? Next week, we'll talk about contemplation without a prompt. That's a different thing altogether. Well, I shouldn't say it's a different thing, but it's, it's a similar thing, but it has some significant differences. So tonight, we're going to talk about sacred reading, Lectio Divina, uh, contemplation of scriptures or meditative prayer, whatever you care to call it. The bottom line is we're going to be using the words of scripture. We're going to be listening to them. And as one writer put it, feeling for an opening feeling for an opening that God will give us, okay? I have gobs of books on these topics, by the way. If you're ever interested in reading more, I don't feel like dragging them to <coughs> class, but I have a lot of good material on these topics if, if you're ever like, I'd like to know more about that. I've got it. Um, John, the first John chapter one, verse three, oh, first John chapter one, verses one and three if you were in a Zoom unison that we did a couple of months ago, one night we did a Zoom unison when it was real snowy, and we did meditative prayer on the gospel, and you may remember some of what I'm saying now based on that night because I went through it very quickly. But 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3 says that those who knew Jesus in the flesh, including presumably the writer of 1 John, they wrote what we now call Scripture, so that we can know, and this is a quote, 
what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what they have heard, what they have seen, what we have seen with our eyes, he says, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and so that we may have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. They wrote for that reason. They were eyewitnesses. They were, they, he says, they saw it with their eyes, they heard it, they touched, they saw Jesus, they touched him. They're writing what they're writing in order that we may have fellowship with God. So that's the, that is one of the bases on which we use scripture for a basis for meditation. I think it's important also to understand that a number of you said at the beginning of this class, and you've repeated it a couple of times, that your desire is to know God, to have a deeper relationship with God, to have a more experiential relationship with God. I would say it's important that you understand you're not knocking on a closed door. You're not knocking on a closed door when you have that, imp that impulse. The door is always open. God doesn't always give you a way in. So if you've walked up in your mind, in your spirit, you've, you, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the invitation of the Holy Spirit, you've said to yourself, I'd like to have a deeper relationship with God. That will happen. You will, you will receive that. Now, I can't tell you how and I can't tell you when, but I can tell you that God is as good as his promise. He's not out there mocking you. The Bible plainly says God doesn't mock people. He, if he gives you an inclination toward getting closer to God, well, that's surely not going to be from anything but God. Nobody else is going to give you that inclination. So that's from God. Our desire to know God is a mirror of God's desire to be intimate with us. And that seems so weird, like what? Because I mean, most of my life I have lived with God as a very real being, but like out there, you know, like a big being. Something, you know, I never had these pictures like God sitting on a throne or anything. I'm not very imagistic like that. But I didn't think of God as someone with me, you know, like, like intimately. I mean, with me in a certain sense, yes, but not like relationally, not like experientially. But when you begin to have those experiences, you realize that God's not just an abstract idea. He's not just an abiding presence in some kind of nebulous sense. God is a real being with you. A little bit weird, yes, but true. The interaction of the Holy Spirit with our imagination in sacred reading is prayer. So right away, we have to get off the train that says prayer is always words. Remember, we talked about that at the very beginning. Prayer is not always words. Prayer is not always conceptual ideas. Sometimes prayer is a feeling. Again, I will say more and try to, try to rein in misconceptions about that, but sometimes prayer is a sense that we have experientially. It's not, well, I, I heard God say, that, 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 you know, I heard, I heard this, I didn't hear. No, sometimes it's a sense of being. I told the group on Sunday morning at our practicum, one of my brothers-in-law is um, not a, not a church-going person. I don't know exactly what he believes, but he's not a church-going person. But he and his wife, my sister, went to Spain some years ago. And I've never forgotten his, his comments about an experience they had at a, a tourist site. It was like a cathedral or a monastery or something, I don't remember exactly, but it was a religious place. I don't think, I don't know that people were practicing religion there now, but anyway, they went there as tourists, of course. And he said to me later, this is a paraphrase, but he said later to me, if there is a God, I met him there. And he just, he apparently had, and I, I, I'm paraphrasing him, he, I'm sure he could be more eloquent about it, but he apparently had an experience like whammo. Now, I don't know what it changed about his conceptions about God. I don't know what it changed about his, you know, beliefs, so to speak, his intellect, his behavior. I don't have any idea about that. But he was unflinching, and he's told me that account a couple of times on, in different occasions. They went there, and I said, like, what were you doing? They weren't worshiping. They weren't, you know, going to communion or something. They were just looking around like tourists. But he said, you know, the Irish would say that was a thin place. But, but these people were Spanish, they weren't Irish, so that's totally different. But the idea is that, you know, in that place at that time, I, you know, what was in God's mind? I don't know. Did he design that or is he just always in residence there that whoever goes there? I don't know. But my brother-in-law really had that experience. And you perhaps have had that sort of experience. Some people said that in, in the practicum on Sunday, just had powerful experiences, kind of like unbidden and un recountable in some ways. You know, you're just like telling this and you think, I'm not even doing it justice. I'm telling you this, but it just sounds so stupid when I start talking about it. But it really happened. 
So the interaction that the Holy Spirit has with your imagination, your interior being, it's more than just your ideas. It's more than that. That is prayer. So sacred reading is active mental prayer. So you, you're there. You're showing up. You're doing some things that focuses on the words and images of Holy Scripture so that our imaginations are stirred and our faith is fueled and perhaps even our experiences, our understanding is enhanced. So our imaginations are stirred, our faith is fueled, and it may even have something to do with the way you understand things, intellectually speaking. So I want to take you to a place in Scripture on your handout you see there at the top of your handout. What does Scripture say about listening for Jesus? This is a very key story in Scripture about listening for Jesus. Would someone be willing to read that Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42, please? distracted by all the preparations that she, that she was that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you fear that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. So, uh, just a translation note. See there in verse 42, if you know this verse, these verses by heart, you may be surprised at the way that's translated. Many times a translation will say, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. But do you see how that's translated slightly differently? That has to do with different manuscripts from which the translations are done. So some translations will just use the phrasing, only one thing is necessary. Other translations will use the manuscripts that have the fuller expression there, there are many, many things, a few things are needed, but indeed only one. But that word indeed is really key. Jesus basically says a few things are needed, well, really just one. You know, he kind of, kind of corrects himself and corrals it. So, but the point is, Mary has chosen what is better. Well, what has Mary chosen? See, if you're at a women's conference back in the 1980s, you're going to want to really argue this because Martha seems to be the good girl here. She's up making the biscuits. You know, she's getting dinner ready. She's putting food on the table. When I was growing up, that's what women did. We didn't go in the living room where they were watching ball games on TV. We didn't go outside where they were shooting or you know, doing archery or whatever, swinging you know, golf balls and golf clubs. We stayed in the kitchen and cooked and cleaned. That's all we did. That was your invitation to the Sunday dinner, believe you me. And I know a lot of women who never sat down. They never had a place at the table to sit even. They were busy cooking and cleaning. Now. You know, some of us escaped and went on to have full lives and tell the story. But, you know, one of my, one of my nephews says to his mother, how did you get out, Mom? Well, we, we got out. So anyway, the point being, in this story, it's not that Martha's the bad girl. She is doing something necessary. This is a setup, obviously. It's a setup designed to tell us something. What is it that Mary has chosen? Since she's clearly doulas, as my mother would have said. That's an old southern expression. She's doulas, not doing anything. Just sitting around, not doing anything. She ought to be up helping, shouldn't she? But what has she chosen? She's chosen relationship with Jesus. Exactly, Jenny. She's chosen to sit. It literally says she was sitting at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. She was just sitting there at his feet in a, you know, we, we use that as a, a visual. She's sitting down under his leadership, under his teaching, so to speak, under his lordship, and she's just listening. It doesn't even say that she's asking questions. It's not, not a dialogue. She's listening. I'd love to know what Jesus was saying that day, wouldn't you? I'd love to know what he was saying. But we don't know that. The point of the lesson is not what Jesus was saying. It was that Mary was listening. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to do a practice of one of these, and then on Sunday in the practicum, we'll do another one from a different scripture. But I just want to go through a couple more things. The practice of sacred reading is as old, practically as old as the church. 
Some of you may remember two or three months ago, the community um, group leaders and a couple of other people from the congregation did some training. And I believe it was Chelsea who did the session on Lexio Divina. And I have her notes. She said some of these same things, but some of you all weren't there, so I'll repeat it. Sacred reading uh, was introduced to the church early on, uh, after only 100 or 150 years after, as far as we know, after the church began. But Lexio Divina really became significant in that phrase under the leadership of a man called Benedict who began the Benedictine order of monks. Saint, Saint according to the Roman Catholics, Benedict was in the mid-6th century who began the, the order and wrote what's called the rule of Saint Benedict. The rule of Saint Benedict is not what it sounds like. It sounds like, you know, get up at this time, go to bed. It's not really that. It's more like a catechism, more like a curriculum. And one of the three major aspects of the curriculum, there are basically three. One, one was liturgical prayer, one was work, and the other was sacred reading. That's what, that's what Benedict said that monks should do. Now again, this is sixth century, so this is long ago, not modern monks, but this is what Benedict said. They ought to do liturgical prayer, which meant gathering nine times a day to sing the Psalms. Basically, that's what, that's what monasteries do, not perhaps from the very beginning, but eventually. And work, they were to do work, whatever that was, gardening, winemaking, you know, working in the community, usually not in those days, but eventually. And then Lexio Divina. Now, of course, the kicker was they weren't, most of them were not literate. So for almost all of the monks in those days, their Lexio Divina was listening. They were doing the merry thing. They were listening, lots of times during dinner or during meals, while someone would read. And they were hearing the same scriptures over and over, eventually the whole Bible. They would hear all the scriptures, with the Apocrypha, of course, too. They would hear the whole scripture over and over and over. Now, they didn't go off then into groups and discuss it, for the most part. It was, it was just absorbed. But one would have to assume, based upon the work of the monasteries and the fact that monasteries continue, that there was some spiritual growth going on there even if we can't, you know, actually evaluate it as such. So the early monks did sacred reading by listening. Well, in the 15th century, the founder of the Jesuits, so the founder of the Benedictines kind of got the ball rolling in a big way. The founder of the Jesuits, the Order of the Society of Jesus, Ignatius Loyola, kind of ramped it up. He writes a work called Spiritual Exercises, which is, a very rich work, and even if you're not Catholic, you owe it to yourself to get a translation and, and just take a quick look at it. We may do some more with that later, but I noticed Eric referred to it in his sermon last Sunday on the examine. That's, that's Ignatius Loyola. So Loyola, though, expands the practice of sacred reading by giving it kind of a structure. Loyola was all about structure. So he gives it kind of a structure step by step, and we'll look at those in just a second. So in the intervening centuries then, since Loyola, since the, the 16th century, late 15th, early 16th century, Christians of many traditions have practiced sacred reading, but it kind of kicked in for American Christians and especially American Protestants in the second half of the 20th century with people like Richard Foster, if you've ever heard of a book called The Celebration of Discipline, Foster, um, his uh, expanded work in a group called Renovare, he does. So that, he's certainly not the only person, there were many people, Susan Muto, um, and the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, although Bonhoeffer didn't live long enough to see them become as popular as they are now. Bonhoeffer is also really big on this. I have a wonderful book of Bonhoeffer's on the concept of Lexio Divina. But the point being, in the second half of the 20th century, this kind of hit the Protestant world. Sort of like Pentecostalism hit the Catholic world sort of mutually, mutually uh, enriched. But at any rate, over time, over the centuries since the very beginning of the church, this practice has evolved. There's lots of different strategies, lots of different ways of doing it. And what we're going to do tonight is kind of an amalgam of a couple of different ways. But they all have common goals. So take a look there. I believe you've got this on your handout. In fact, I'm virtually certain you do. Yes. All the methods that I'm aware of have common goals. One is to take part in a living conversation with God. That's, that's part of the goal. When I say conversation, I don't necessarily mean he says this and you say that and he says that. It's not necessarily a dialogue, but it is a communication, an active communication with God. To be instead of do. Think Mary, not Martha. 
So this is not a prayer. This is not a prayer concept that involves you making a list of your petitions or even a list of the things you're thankful for. This is not a this is not a list making kind of prayer. This is a being kind of prayer. Just like sitting there and receiving. The hardest thing in the world to do. Believe you me, when we start listening, you start listening to me read this scripture, your mind will go all over the place. I think I've shared with you before that I, for the most part, I listen to scripture being read more than I read it because I taught literature for so long. When I look at text, I start analyzing immediately. That's just what I do. That's, it's just like musicians who start hearing it in their heads. You know, I just, I look at text, I'm doing analysis. That's not what I want to do when I'm doing this kind of reading. So I listen to an audio recording and it's a beautiful person's voice. He reads wonderfully and I listen to the same passage three times, at least three times. I never listen to the whole thing paying attention, as, as Susan said. I'm thinking about what's going on in the kitchen. I'm thinking about what time is it. I'm thinking about what's, wh why is there an ambulance down at the end of the block? You know, I'm thinking, what's going on? What, what do I need to do next? My foot's itching. You know, all of those things. Seriously, you know, there's just, next week it'll get even worse when we do contemplative prayer because at least this week you've got a story to try to think about. But even when you've got a concept, and especially if you're familiar with it, your mind will wander. So what we're trusting here is that somehow God's going to use the fallible, you know, wayward human mind to intersect his spirit and to use the words of Scripture, the writings of the Scripture writers, to use those writings and our wayward minds to reveal something about himself to us. And I can promise you, I can't promise you how it will feel or when this will happen to you. I certainly can't make any commitments about tonight, but I can say that a, a renewed and, and, and a, a repeated experience of this practice will make a difference in your spiritual life. I can absolutely guarantee you of that. I know that it will. It has mine, and there's absolutely nothing special about the way I listen. My ears don't work very well as it is, so I have to listen really hard. So good, good thing. And then the, the fourth goal is to know God as he reveals himself. Not to know God as we parse him and we, we analyze him and we speculate about him and we dream of it. No, to know God as he reveals himself. You know, think about dating. You know, think about meeting somebody. You know, how, when you really get beyond, you know, like, well, I work so-and-so, I go to school, I do this, I do that, you know, I'm this old, I, I like this, I like that. When you really get beyond and the person starts to really reveal himself or herself. Think about it. That's, that's when you get to know the person. When the person sort of starts actually letting you know who they are. Not just, well, do you like this kind of movie? Do you like that kind of movie? Where do you want to go for dinner? No, really something real about them. And that's what God does in, sa in sacred reading. And the last thing is to enjoy and embrace whatever God reveals. I don't know whether Mary sat down that day wanting the answer to some pressing theological question. Maybe she did. She'd been around Jesus a lot. Maybe she had a question about something he'd said before or done before. I don't know if she got her question answered, but she got whatever Jesus wanted to give her that day. Whatever she heard was what he wanted. I think also we need to understand that all of the strategies of sacred reading, regardless of how they are set up, have some common guidelines. And You'll hear more about this. So many prayer books start at this point. Be still. Get quiet. <laughs> Calm your body and silence your surroundings. I have a couple of prayer books that spend the first two chapters on those concepts right there, period. Be still. Get still. We are very bad at that. I don't know how culturally specific that is. I don't know enough about other cultures to know whether other cultures have an easier time getting still than we do, but I know my toes are always tapping. I mean, I almost always know exactly what time it is. When I'm thinking about what time it is, I usually know. I mean, I just, I just tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I, that just, you know, built in from all these years. So that's not a good thing. That's just a thing. So maybe you always are like me. You look at the pictures on the wall and you think, oh, the pictures are, oh, those are not level. I can't stand that. I hate that. I have like an interior level I can't stand. So what are those little settings are in your life? You've got to work on stilling those. And of course, you're asking the Holy Spirit to still them. Well, I always have coffee first thing in the morning. I can't do this prayer thing first thing in the morning. Well, 
Maybe the Holy Spirit can still that craving for 10 seconds for you to have a prayer life. Think about it. You know, maybe the Holy Spirit wants you to have these experiences, and so he will help you to carve out that. But be still, get quiet, and of course, mute your phone, turn the TV off, you know, so on and so forth, all the things that would. And you can't do this with people around. You've got to find a spot, you know, some some bathroom or closet or private place. And I, I don't try to do this at the park either because there's too much going on in nature around me, too much distraction. I can't do that. I usually do this very, very early. I get up really early. I like getting up early and I'll do this at maybe like 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning in my sunroom, which looks out on Pershing and Union. So there's a lot of traffic there, but I don't pay any attention to that. I'm not going down there. So, you know, it's I, the, the lights and everything, that doesn't bother me at all. It's really dark usually and quiet. Even the street lights don't seem to be intrusive. So I can do that then. In a really dark room, I wouldn't be able to do it because I'd be distracted by the darkness. I have to have some setting, some concept. So you have to decide what works for you. But find a place, find a time, find some silence, find some solitude. You can do sacred reading in groups. We're going to do it tonight. But it's best at least begun individually in private. Do it a few times by yourself. And then allow God to do the talking. I love a paraphrase that I read in a book this week. And this is not, this is a, apparently this was a line in a real book, but then the author paraphrased it and I wasn't able to get back to the original person. So somebody said this in, in a more elegant way. If you ever get the opportunity to keep your mouth shut, take it. <laughs> I love that. It sort of seemed funny to me. If you ever get the opportunity to keep your mouth shut, take it. So with God, he doesn't want you to talk. You don't have to start talking. And what a blessing that is. Don't have to say anything. Don't have to worry about whether I'm saying the right thing. Don't have to worry. The third guideline there, common guidelines, is have faith. God is present in this prayer experience. Don't listen to the devil telling you there's nothing to this because he will tell you that. You will have that in your mind. Well, this is just, this is ridiculous. What, what am I doing here? There's not even anything happening. I'm not getting anything out of this. That's, that's the very way the devil tries to do something. Is God as good as his word? Is he going to show up? Think about the Garden of Eden. What did the devil say to Adam and Eve? God is a liar. God, you can't trust anything he says. Well, so if you start sitting there thinking, well, there's nothing to this. This is a waste of time. You're essentially saying, I don't have faith that God is willing to do what he says he'll do. So have faith. Hold on. Put aside the desire for results. Put aside that desire for results. You can't measure the results of this kind of prayer you shouldn't go into it thinking, well, if I don't get X, Y, and Z, I'm trying to decide whether to take that job or not. You know, maybe I hope the Lord's going to have something to say to me today. Well, he may or may not, you know. Last one there is, yes, meditative prayer is all in your head because God created you and gave you a mind that thinks and communicates. Don't let the devil devalue this experience. God is present. And even though you're only experiencing it in an abstract way, you're not seeing anything, you're not hearing anything orally, and you begin to question whether, did I really, was that really a sense of God or was I just, you know, like hungry? You know, well, seriously, you know that line from Dickens' Christmas Carol where the ghost is appearing to Scrooge and he says, you could be a bit of underdone potato. You know, you might just be my stomach upset. And I think I'm seeing a ghost. So you may, you're having this prayer experience. Afterwards, believe you me, the devil's going to come to you at some point and say, well, that was ridiculous. That wasn't anything. You're just making that up. That's why I like to write it down. And I can go and say, right there it is in my journal. Don't tell me. It did happen. That doesn't always help either, but sometimes it does. So common cautions, okay? Sacred reading is not an exercise in analysis. Avoid following distractions into word definitions, biblical context, larger theological issues, etc. The passage I'm going to read tonight has some stuff in it about the architecture of Jerusalem. Try to avoid beginning to worry about, I'd like to go to Jerusalem someday. I wonder what that really looked like. <laughs> it's like, it's just, oh, in a rabbit trail, going down a rabbit hole. You know, this is Alice in Wonderland. But avoid trying to like, I don't even know what that word means. Okay, move on. The Lord knows what you know and what you don't know and what you need to know. Move on. 
Sacred reading is for the purpose of falling more deeply in love with God, not for the furtherance of intellectual interests. That's a, there's another time for that. You can do Bible study another time. This is not Bible study. This is scriptural meditation on scripture. Results vary from person to person because of individual differences. Some people are extremely Im imaginative. They can, like I really do see, like I can almost tell you if I were directing a film, I'd know exactly how things ought to look in my mind. That's just the way it's set up. I think those of us who grew up with video, you know, film, TV and stuff, I think we have that much more than people like, you know, my mom or something who didn't think like that. She thought about printed pages. She didn't think about films, like who's in the foreground, who's in the background. So we have, a, we have an aid in that regard. So we've got that. But some people are not like that. They're, they're too um, annoyed by detail. They can't, they can't think in terms of large context. So ask the Holy Spirit again, meet me where I am, God. Not where I ought to be or where, where somebody else is. But results will vary. You may not have the same experience someone else has. And if we start talking about it afterwards, which we may have time to do, you might be like, oh gosh, I, I wish I'd gotten, I wish that happened to me. I didn't get that, you know. Be aware of that. Beware. We're supposed to be encouraging each other, not evaluating ourselves against each other. That's really dangerous. But it's important that we share. So we'll try. Sometimes not much happens. <laughs> That's important, just to know. Faithfulness is everything. Give it a shot. You don't know what happened. Maybe I should have put that next. Sometimes not much happens as far as we know. That's important. <laughs> then because meditative prayer uses the imagination, which is a God-given part of our human identity, people who practice it should be careful to distinguish between fantasy and prayer images, between daydreaming and prayerful meditation. I can't tell you exactly how to do this except that you need to be using the Word of God as the launch pad for your prayer and also the measuring rod against which your results are evaluated. You know what I'm saying? So if you end up having script, scriptural meditation a few times and you think, well, the Lord wants me to uh, quit my job and move to Canada. Well, maybe. Be careful. <laughs> or, or, you know, more to the point, the Lord wants me to leave my husband. This is, this is a famous medieval trope. Women being called by the Lord to leave their husband and go over to the Holy Land to do something. Really? When did the Lord call us to do something that is in clear violation of a commitment we've made? You know, that doesn't make any sense. So be careful. I like to have valued, spiritually mature people with whom I can share if I have a realization and I can say to them, you know, the Lord is really showing me this about myself or he's really showing me this about something that I thought. And what do you think about that? So I have a spiritually mature friend or two who can, with whom I can bounce off ideas. But before I even do that, I judge them by the word of God. Of course, if you don't know anything about the word of God, that's pretty hard to do. So get your Bibles, start reading them. Get more comfortable, get more familiar with what scripture says. But if you don't know, if you're thinking, well, I don't know if that's right or not. I, I, is it really the case that, you know, God is a man and a woman and a panda bear? Well, you know, let's think about that. You know, what does the Bible say about that? Seriously, you need to know. And if you don't know, ask someone who does. Ask Eric. He has all the answers. Eric, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, people like <laughs> Eric, you know, he'd say, well, I, I know or I don't know. I'll help you find out. Let's pray about that together or whatever. But my point is you don't go off in a, on a dream world and get into some fantasy land based on what you think God is saying to you during meditative prayer or contemplative prayer, which we'll do next week. This is not an opening for just any spirit or any realization. You know, I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be silly about it, but the Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. If you don't think there's evil out there trolling around to get into your mind, turn on the TV for heaven's sake. Look on the internet. It's all around you. And if you don't think that stuff is going to encroach into your thinking and into your being and into your spiritual life, you are being naive. So be careful as you're allowing God to speak to you that, that it is God. How do I know that? Well, we have the Word of God. That's the whole point. That's why they call it the Word of God. That's why they call Jesus the Word of God. So be careful with that. And again, use your Christian friends. I don't just mean your good friends, that people that you like. I mean people who know Christ and who've had experience in this walk 
and I don't necessarily mean pastors, although there's nothing wrong with pastors, but you know what I'm saying. There's plenty of people around who are experienced and faithful. Use those friends, and if you don't have friends like that, cultivate them. There are plenty of people like that in this congregation and in other congregations as well. Cultivate some friends with whom you can share spiritual things and with whom you can be held accountable and for whom you can do some accountability holding. So, at any rate, a sampler of the kinds of strategies, and then once we go through this, we'll actually do some practice. Uh, again, I'm giving you this just really for, not because you're getting a degree in sacred reading, but just because it might be helpful for you to realize that the Benedictine rule was actually the rule that I remember Chelsea teaching at that community leaders thing. In, in the Benedictine rule, Lectio Divina had four steps, and you, I think you've got them there on your handout, don't you? Yes. All right, well, I'm not going to write them up here. I'll just write the names of them, but for the purposes of people who are at class, contemplate, um, not complain, contemplation, oratio. Am I spelling it? So in the, in the Benedictine model, there are four, four steps to this, and they are stages. So in Benedict's model, you're, you're reading the scripture. Usually, you're listening to it read very slowly, and you're listening to it read repetitively. So you're listening. When I first was acquainted with this method, I, they were reading it three times. And I remember they read it. Wait, 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 they read it. Wait, 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 they read it, read it, read it. So reading a passage a second time and then responding by talking to people. So when I first heard this method, they, this would have been done again. And then talking with other people about it, sharing your ideas, sort of vetting what you have discovered, and then spending time in silence talking with God. That was, that was Benedict's model, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Short and sweet and simple. Susan? No, I'm just holding my head. Holding your head on <laughs> Holding your head on your shoulders. Okay. All right. <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in Ignatius Loyola's model, you can see there, Loyola makes everything more complex by simplifying it. <laughs> he systematizes things and they, become, they look more complex than they really are. But in Ignatius's model, there are eight steps, basically. So he begins with a preparatory prayer for the Holy Spirit's work. And I really think that a, an excellent prayer for that is the words of Samuel, the child when he was a child, prophet, speak for your servant is listening. It's just a wonderful way of starting. Lord, speak for your servant is listening. And then the first prelude is to read the scripture the first time and briefly just sort of take it in, like what's happening there? What is, what is this story? What's going on in that passage? What's the story here? So then the second time you imagine the scene it's physical attributes, it's emotional atmosphere. So the person who's doing the reading can kind of set you up with this. I'll do a little bit of this tonight. Sort of like think about, you know, what's the weather like in this passage? Is that a factor? You know, are they inside, are they outside? Is it a hot day, is it sunny or cloudy, you know? Um, is this a crowded spot or is just a couple of people there with Jesus? You know, what's going on here? So some of that kind of, in other words, you're sort of priming your imaginative pump is what it amounts to. You're just sort of thinking, how, how would you stage this and so forth. The third prelude then is to pray the desire that the scene awakens in you, okay? So after you hear it, in other words, a couple of times, you, what desire does the scene awaken in you? Tonight, the, the one I'm going to use actually has Jesus posing a question to someone. So it may be like I'm trying to say that ought to be what the desire, but your desire may be something totally different. It, the, the story, the, the gospel account I'm going to read tonight may awaken in you a desire of something totally different than, than the question that Jesus actually poses to this individual. It may be the same. It may be different. And then imagine the scene and consider the people in it. Listen to what the people in the scene are saying. Now, again, you may say, well, they're not saying anything. How many people are in the scene as you imagine it? See, Loyola wants you to really imagine like, is there a big crowd around? What are they saying? What, you may know the story as it comes in Scripture and what comes later and what people say. No, we're not talking about do you know any Scripture. Like, in a scene like that, would there have been men and women? Do you think there would have been any animals around? Like, would there be children in that scene? Like, what would they be saying? 
do you think they even listened to Jesus or was he just like milling around, making a lot of noise? And he was just like, a, you know, one guy there with another guy, not, not really, you know, was he the center of attention? Like in scripture, it's like there's a big spotlight on him. You know, we're looking at him through the rear view mirror. We know he's the guy. They didn't know he was the guy. Some of them didn't. So like, are they even paying any attention? What's Jesus' tone of voice like? Is he shouting? In the one I'm going to read tonight, think about the nature of what he's saying to this person. Is he contemptuous? Is he compassionate? Is he impatient? Is he demanding? Is he like, well, for heaven's sake, you know. What, who is Jesus in this passage? See, that's where you'll begin to understand something about who God is. Not because you're making it up, but because whatever you're conceptualizing, the Holy Spirit's going to start working. He's going to start working in kind of a, a godly alchemy, and he's going to make your imagination either affirm what he wants to reveal to you, or he'll say, that's not the way it was at all. That's not the way it was. And at one point or other, I might say to you, or Ignatius Loyola would say, what is, look at Jesus' face. What is his facial expression? Look at Jesus' body language. Is he like talking to somebody but turning to go, like he wants to leave? Or is he fixed on that person? And who is Jesus in this particular scene that you're doing a meditation on? And then at the end, Loyola would say, talk to God about any new awareness and thank God for revealing himself. Thank God for revealing himself even if you didn't get anything out of it. Because again, there may be something happening on a spiritual level that you and I do not immediately access with our, with our you know, minds and spirits. So then I'm offering there one more strategy and this strategy comes from a book that I think I've recommended to you before. It's called The Armchair Mystic um, by... Um, Mark Thibodeau, who is a, a Jesuit priest in New Orleans. And Thibodeau's method doesn't have 12 steps there, but he just, he really details exactly what he does there. So he concentrates early on on saying, get your stuff ready before you start this prayer. So turn your phone off, get your Bible. If you're going to read the scripture to yourself, get your Bible or your phone or whatever you read scripture from. I'm going to say, and you'll think this is really odd, I'm going to say, you might want to read from a print version. And the reason I'm saying that, there's nothing wrong with having the Bible on your phone. I have the Bible on my phone. I use it on my phone. It's easy to find things on and stuff. But there is a different dynamic with print than with screens. They did research on this when computers first began being used in higher education, and they discovered that people don't proofread nearly as well on screen as they do in print. That's just a fact. If you're editing and proofing, you will not proof as well on a screen. It has something to do with the way our vision interacts with the screen. I mean, it's a physical thing. It's not just like she's old-fashioned. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying it might be good to have a Bible, and I like to use a Bible for spiritual meditation that doesn't have any notes in it, and I have not done a lot of underlining and stuff. I have a gillion Bibles, and so I just pick one off the shelf or if I'm reading or I just listen to someone read. So, but if you have more than one Bible, it might be useful. Because again, there's nothing wrong with the screen. I'm not being negative about that. I'm just saying for the purposes of this session, this kind of prayer, it might be good to have print. And then um, Thibodeau says, anything else you're going to use, your journal, if you need a pencil and piece of paper just to write something down, if God tells you something, if you feel like there's a realization there, just jot it down. It'll help you remember it. It'll help you to think about it later. It'll help you to pray about it later if you decide to. Find a comfortable place, but not a sleep-inducing place. I cannot meditate lying down. I will go to sleep. And you may not. You may not have that problem. I definitely will. I just, you know, out like a light. So that's, that's important. I, I know exactly what chair in my house. I always have the same chair for prayer. I used to have a white wingback. It was gorgeous. Of course, then I had a child. He just ruined it. So I had it reupholstered. <laughs> it was still a good wing bag. I finally got rid of it. And now I've got that little brown chair that you like. <laughs> that little brown chair in my house is really good on your back. So, you know, I just, I know what I have and I know where I want to, where I want to be for prayer. You may not be as hidebound as I am. You may be much more flexible. And that's fine, too. Everybody's different about stuff like that. But find a place that's comfortable, a place that's not sleep-inducing. Close your eyes. Get quiet. Calm your body. And then he really doesn't start the meditation till step six. Ask the Holy Spirit to communicate with you and allow you to hear God's word. And then 
you start reading the passage. So Thibodeau does a lot of front-loading stuff because he knows he's a, he was a novice master. He's, he's responsible, was responsible at one time in his career for training Jesuit novices. So he knows what it means to work on people's spiritual formation. That's, so he knows they need this. And Bonhoeffer says this too. Bonhoeffer says in the community of confessing Lutherans, the confessing church that Bonhoeffer and, and others created in Hitler's Germany before Bonhoeffer was arrested, they did sacred reading at the in the morning, and they did it at night. And this is what Bonhoeffer says. We are silent at the beginning of the day because God should have the first word. And we are silent before going to sleep because the last word also belongs to God. We keep silence solely for the sake of the word. This stillness before the word will exert its influence upon the whole day. That, that's what we're talking about, is, is practicing a kind of prayer that is not petitionary, it's not oriented toward deliberate praise or deliberate thanksgiving, it is receptive. Again, picture Mary, picture, picture a person who's just sitting there, receiving, just letting the, the water of the fountain of life just wash over you, just letting it wash over you on a hot, deserty day. You know, you're just receiving that refreshment. That's what it is. And again, if you are interested more in this, I really would recommend to you the book, The Armchair Mystic, because Thibodeau uses so much personal experience, and he talks about how he gets his coffee and he goes in there, you know, it, it's like not happening, you know. <laughs> Should I just get up and start again tomorrow? No, sit still. Just sit there. Just keep sitting there. Read the scripture again. Sit there. And then he uses this wonderful passage. I love it. He talks about how he, he reads the passage. This happened to me the other day. And I was reading, I think it was the 17th chapter of Luke, I believe. It, I could be wrong. But these two men, this man or two men approach Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want? And the people say, we want to see. So I was doing this kind of prayer, and I read that, or I heard it, and that word see just kind of leapt out at me. And immediately I thought, of something my mother always said. My mother was blind and she used to say, when she woke up in heaven, she used to say, I just want to see Jesus' face. So that's my first thought when, she, when I, and I thought, quash that thought. This is not a reminiscence about your mom. It's a beautiful thought, but that's not where God's going with this. Why did that word come up? And so I, I listened to it again. I punched the button and listened to the, the chapter again. And that, again, that concept of, and so the way that, Tib, that Mark Thibodeau, the armchair mystic, talks about this is he says, that's like you're reading along and then that word just gets bigger. Like it gets bigger in your mind. Like it just starts expanding in your mind. And he says, just sit there like you're in a very, very dark room and you're feeling the walls for where the openings are. Just sit there with that word or that phrase. Just sit there with it and let it take time and see what God does with that. But for me, it was this passage where Jesus asked this person, what do you want? And he said, we want to see. So I don't even remember the rest of the story, as you can tell. <laughs> Not a detail-oriented person. I got the word see, though. That's what God wanted. And so then what happens is, as you're sitting there, that word expands. You spend some time thinking about it. It may open up. God may open up something else. He may think about what are you seeing spiritually. You know, a lot of things might go on. But eventually then the word begins to kind of resume its normal sort of sense. And you listen to the scripture again. You think, was I missing something? No, now it's just a regular scripture. The word's not like leaping up, you know, and expanding in my mind. So again, I can't, I can't make it much more specific than this, but I think this is enough. So any questions before we go on and actually do some, some experience with this? Okay, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're not already in a comfortable seating position, find one. And I'm going to ask you to lay everything aside so you're not holding on to your pencil and paper or anything, because that always makes me think, oh, I've got to write something down. I better be taking notes or something. Yeah, we can do that later. Okay. The passage I'm going to read is fairly short, so I'll read it several times. If there's anything that feels like an encumbrance to you, like I can't do this with my glasses on when I'm doing, when I'm trying to pray like this, they bother me. 
So I have to take that off. I can't do it with earrings on. I said, like, I have to, I'm really particular. So whatever, if something's bothering you, like your mask or something, just take it off and try not to breathe, you know, just don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. I'm not, I'm not worried about that right now. Okay, so close your eyes. And this will seem very slow. It will seem excruciating. I have my eye on the clock. We will not be here past 8.30. Don't worry, okay? Don't worry. You don't have to worry about that. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once, the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Imagine the scene. This is a feast time. This is Jerusalem. This is a pool with five roofed colonnades and multitudes around them. Imagine the light. Where is Jesus in this scene? How close are you to Jesus? Can you hear the water? Can you hear the sounds the people there are making? After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five 
roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Focus your mind now on Jesus in the scene. Is he already standing there or do you see him walking toward the invalid people? Is he in a hurry? Think about Jesus' face as he looks at the people, the multitudes of people. And think about his facial expression as he turns to the man to whom he speaks. Listen to his tone of voice, the speed of his words, the volume of his words. Is he speaking only to that man or is he speaking to other people? Listen again. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, 
do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. <coughs> if any words or phrases seem strong in your mind, say them over to yourself silently. Just say them over and over silently. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. In the next few minutes, silently talk to God about any observations you made, any new awareness, any concerns, any desires that arose in you as a result of hearing this passage. And I'll call this part of the service to a close when a few moments have passed.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Quickly, get a writing implement, a piece of paper, and write down anything that came in your mind, any observation, anything that you want to write. I will not be asking you to share this, so this is for your sake. Don't be distressed if you find yourself with nothing to write. Again, we can't program what's going to happen. But I'm pleased to see we're not asleep. That's a good thing. <laughs> I can promise you this will absolutely lower your blood pressure and your heart rate. So if you have a bad heart rate, <laughs> you might want to pump up before you get here. So I won't ask you to share your experiences. I think that's counterproductive the first few times we do this because I think it begins to be, oh gosh, I didn't get anything out of it and I don't know what to say or people feel like they have to sort of, you know, expand when they're, you know, this is, this is your experience, not anyone else's. But I'm asking you to write because I think it is important that you have a sense of what happened to you. Even if nothing happens, like it was really boring, I didn't get anything out of it, you know, okay, that's okay. But if, if anything happened, it's important to realize that. Susan, did you? The scripture was um, John chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, and I believe that was the NIV, most recent NIV translation, I think. Um, on your homework or on your handout there, you see that some other suggested passages, any passage of scripture. Frankly, I think this method works best with narrative passages, but I don't limit them to the Gospels. Now, Traditionally, Lexio Divina and, and all, you might think of those as being gospel passages like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But I, I, there's certainly some narrative passages in Acts, plenty of narrative passages in the Old Testament. I mean, I find a lot of fruitful God revealing in those passages too. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to start with the gospels because the obvious emphasis is Jesus. And isn't it interesting how when I said to you, where is Jesus like, was he there or did he come in the scene while you're watching? That's really interesting to me. As far as I know, there's only one passage in all the gospels where Jesus walks into the scene after the readers are already there. We'll talk about that another time. That's an interesting passage, though. But these are just uh, other passages that I've sometimes used. There's John, the John passage is actually there buried into one of these. But there's all kinds of passages. You don't want to do too long a passage. I would stick to something that's like 10, 15 verses at most. That's, that's like the most. Because when you get longer than that, and that's hard to do. Sometimes the gospel accounts, don't, they're not segregated in such a way that they stand alone. But, but lots of times they do, so. Any thoughts about this, this concept? Again, I'm not asking you what happened to you or anything like that. I don't want you to tell that. But any questions or comments about this sort of method of prayer in general? Okay, we'll do. Yes, sir. Inevitably, you will. Right. And so how can we distinguish between what, what we're projecting versus what God's word is kind of making sense? Well, again, I think that's, that's going to be a matter of experience. It's also going to be a matter of sharing probably with someone other than you yourself. But I think also after a while, it's trust. You know, I know there's, you know, there's a, 
a crazy person behind every, every column, but my point being, I really think that over the course of time, God is going to reveal to you what you want to know, what He wants you to know. And in my experience, and this, this is just my experience now, lots of times it's something you weren't looking for. You know, like when I read a passage like that, immediately as a pastor and a teacher and a preacher, I want to go to the do you want to be healed. That's the key question there. So you want to ask that of people. That's a counseling question. That's a pastoring question. But there, there, may, be another, there may be another issue in here altogether. Like what does it mean for the water to be stirred up? What an interesting image. I know what that means in the story. He's talking about living water. Like, what is it? How does God stir up in you? You know, so there's a lot of images buried in here that we don't even think of as very significant. What about all those other people? You know, how do you think they felt? So maybe when you're praying, you're one of those other people that hadn't gotten it yet. You didn't get yours yet. And so maybe God wants to deal with bitterness in you. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. So lots of times it's not going to be what you think. Definitely there's going to be some projection going on. And if you've been a Christian and a Bible reader and you've been exposed to this stuff a long time, you're full of it, you know. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Maybe good stuff. Maybe, maybe what you're projecting is exactly, you know, maybe, maybe you're resonating with what God's saying. But maybe not, too. I, the older I get, the longer I'm a Christian, and I don't think this is entirely uh, unique to me, I think the more it is the case that God's revelations are a surprise to me. Whoa, didn't see that coming, you know. Didn't see that coming. And they're usually revelations about something God is doing in my life, some, trans, some transformation, some, some sin, some sanctifying experience, some transforming God is doing in my life. Not that everything's about me, but my point is, God's probably not got a lesson here for me to tell Susan. Susan, you need to start doing X, you know. Jenny, you need to start. This is for Jenny. <laughs> no, I'm not getting a word for you, you know. <laughs> I'm getting a word from God for me. Now, it may have application in the way that I treat you, in the way that I'm living with you, but I'm not giving an instruction. I mean... I don't care who you are. I don't get zapped with a word for you. Like, you know, Jen, Carrie, you need to start you know, doing this or that. Wear more, wear more pink, Carrie. Really, what does that have to do with anything? You know what I'm saying? That's not what God's doing. I mean, I know that's a thing and then blah, blah, blah. But that's not, I'm, that's not what we're talking about here. It's about you. So if you present yourself before God and he has a revelation to give you, trust that until the Holy Spirit gives you a way of saying, yeah, that's really not what this is about. Okay, do it again tomorrow. Keep doing it with the same passage. You know, just trust that God is bigger than your mind and mine and, you know, our collective minds. God knows how to set things straight. He knows how to set us straight if we'll let him. So, good question, Matt. Trust Matt for the good questions. He's a good questioner. Thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate, uh, Marsha, I'm glad you were able to be here tonight and others who maybe haven't uh, been here before or haven't been here much. Um, I realize there are several people not here. I don't see Dale and Suzanne, uh, you know, um, Carla, Chelsea. So people who aren't here, encourage them to come back just because we miss them when they're not here. But Sunday's practicum, we will be doing this kind of thing again. That's what we'll do Sunday. So be ready for that. You might want to, um, we'll bring pencils or paper or whatever. So anyway, let's just uh, have a word of prayer before you go, please. Lord God, we thank you for your presence in this time. We really do try to be honest with ourselves that we are listening, even though our minds are racing a mile an hour, just going and going and going, Lord. Help us, Lord, to receive from you what you would have us to receive this evening and in the days ahead. And as we go, God, help us to use what you give us to love you and those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good time.